it's Helen Patterson from Life Works Well. Uh, happy you could join us today. I'm very excited about today. Uh, we have a special guest who I'll introduce in a bit. And we're going to be talking about creating successful mentorship programs. Um, so today's agenda, uh, we have, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges that come with mentorship programs. We're going to talk about getting buy-in for them. Um, how to bring mentor programs into small organizations. And then a little bit about virtual mentorship, as much as we can get in um, our Q&A with Sean Mintz. And so, as you know, this is a big passion here at Life Works Well. Uh, we truly believe in the value of mentorship. And so I'm very excited for our guest today. Uh, before we begin, I just want to, oh, I'm going to admit someone else. I just want to welcome everybody and acknowledge the land that we're meeting on. And I'm here in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and home to many diverse First Nations. Um, we're continuing our journey of reconciliation here. And um, I love that uh, Turtle Island, they talk about the dish with one spoon and sharing. And the mentor circles were really started during the pandemic to bring people together for dialogue. And really, I love the circle way, um, really having everyone have a seat in the table. So that's how we sort of started. And I, if you want to let us know where you're from in the chat, um, what territory you're on, um, honor the treaties or the people before us, that would be great. Uh, so um, I just think it's so important, the value of giving and mentorship, you know, really all of my mentor experiences as a mentor, um, I have grown just as much from those relationships. And so you're going to hear a little bit about um, Sean's background in a bit as well. And, you know, really, it is such a powerful relationship. And it's about giving and the gift of giving back. So take a moment and just reflect on maybe some of the uh, relationships you've had, and maybe you haven't even realized that it's a mentorship organic or whatever, but we're going to talk a lot about mentorship. Um, so you can read this later. Um, both Sean and I were involved in through SHRM, um, which is the um, US organization, put out a, a survey recently. And so there really is this desire for mentoring and coaching. Um, and I think we've seen the coaching industry boom as well. Um, but more and more newer generations also want mentorship. They'll look at that as an attraction. And so these were just a few of the stats. I can share this later. Um, I, for those who are here with me once a month, they know I love the stats. I love sharing information. So, um, you know, it's really important to have that when we talk a little bit later about buy-in and convincing stakeholders to Im implement a program, it's nice to have some of this information. Um, so I'm really loving that this is becoming much more top of mind over the last few years. So Sean, um, I will stop the share the screen in a minute so I can bring him out, but I am so happy we met, I met Sean through HRPA. Um, and actually, Joanne, you were quite a part of met, um, HRPA before. So Mentor City um, actually is the platform that we, we use at the HR Professional Association here in Ontario. And so I, because I'm chair of mentorship for Toronto West, I ended up meeting Sean interviewed him for my upcoming book and um, just loved Sean's journey, his experience. He's, um, you know, created amazing award-winning mentor initiatives, has been recognized with awards. Um, you know, I'm pretty feeling pretty blessed to be in your presence today. So I'm very um, honored to have you here today and just talk about your passion. We've chatted before, but for people that might be watching this later or for for those who join us today, it's just amazing to have this passion and also your commitment to new Canadians as well that, you know, the more we can give back through mentorship and helping others, the more that this ripple effect will be created. So congrats on all those awards, your course online, I put it in the resources at the end. 
a little bit about Mentor City. That's I'll let you, I know I'll let you um, talk a little bit about Mentor City. Uh, actually, maybe you just want to give us a quick overview now, and then I can I can um, you know what kind of brought you to um, creating Mentor City. What was your journey to get you here? I'm very curious. Yes, yeah. Thanks, Helen. It's been such a pleasure working with you, and it's nice to be here today with everyone. Um, so I, I look forward to just having a conversation about mentoring and best practices, things that are working at organizations. So uh, what brought me to Mentor City is in, um, I used to work in the not-for-profit sector before I started Mentor City. And um, we were helping, the organization that I worked for was helping newcomers to Canada find that first job in Canada. And in 2006, I started a mentoring program and basically, um, newcomers to Canada were able to meet with a mentor for like 10 minutes and then move to another mentor. And by the end of the hour, um, they had met so many um, new uh, mentors and uh, built their networks in Canada. And after every conversation, after every event, people were so excited and the energy was so amazing and people were giving each other high fives and they were ready to take on the world. And um, I just got so inspired by watching people have these interactions and, and that was the inspiration for Mentor City is just to allow more people to have these impactful uh, mentoring conversations that can make everything possible. That, that is amazing. I just feel like, um, you know, it's interesting to me because I spoke with quite a few people who had said they, you know, they never had a mentor experience. And, and, you know, but when you think back, maybe there's those teachers or those role models, right? So, so let me ask you a little bit again about so when, how did you come up with this idea for Mentor City and the platform itself? Yeah, so when I saw the impact of mentoring, and how powerful it was. Um, and I said to myself, okay, I have to do something more about this. Um, eventually in 2011, I came up with the idea of Mentor City. And at first it was just like, a, like almost like a LinkedIn for mentoring or eHarmony for mentoring, we used to always say back in 2011, uh, where people could just connect with each other and have these mentoring relationships. Um, so basically, so I came up with the idea in April and I talked to two of my mentors about the idea, April 2011, and they gave me enough courage and confidence to move forward with the idea. Um, so very soon after that, I started talking to like a software developer um, who's still with the Mentor City team. And um, by September, October that year, I decided to leave my full-time job, which was very hard to do because I worked there for like 13 years. And uh, that was one of the hardest things I had to do is like to leave a place that I was really passionate about, really, um, it felt like my baby a little bit, or one of my babies, because I, I loved what we were doing and what we were able to create. Uh, but I left and I focused just on Mentor City and building a mentoring platform that um, can be used by so many people. Yeah, amazing. So that's a I little love bit about the journey. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. And I know we'll touch on a lot of other things too, but I, I was, it's interesting because when I, rec when I think back now, even before my time with the HRPA, Human Resources Professional Association, I came across Mentor City and tried out, and I want to ask you a little bit about this. I tried out the section that's for everyone. So this is for anyone in the world if you don't have a program, which I love because to me, you know, it's really about creating mentor cultures. You work with organizations, so you create, they create the programs. But then what about people that aren't part of a program? And so you have this up, this availability to connect. And the first time I used Mentor City, I actually connected with someone in the UK and just oh, wow. <laughs> trying out your free. And I forgot to, I don't know if I ever told you that, but it was before I got involved with the HRPA. And so I sort of started to see this and I obviously 
things have changed a lot in the last five years, like mentorship has really grown and there's a lot more platforms, but what, when you started, like how many people actually use the, like the, the free one that's for everyone? Do you find that people are still caught hopping on and, and connecting all over the world? Yeah, yeah, the free one always has been growing for the last like 10, 11 years. Um, and that was kind of like where we wanted to focus all our efforts on was the free version. Um, um, but it's because it's more like a passion project to be able to give mentoring to. So if you don't work at a huge corporation that has a mentoring program, you can still find mentors from all over the world. Um, so I think it's constant. It's always growing, the public site, the free version. And we're hearing like success stories of mentoring, which is so nice. Like there's this one person in Pakistan um, doing artificial intelligence, like is his company. And um, artificial intelligence and for, like, for um, publishing, like writing kind of thing. And I was... I connected him to a mentor in, or Mentor City connected him to a mentor in Canada. And then I saw later on on LinkedIn that he was his mentor was talking about him um, wow. as his mentee. And I was like, holy moly, that happened on Mentor City, that relationship. And um, yeah, it's just like so cool to see like if that, there is that kind of connection. It's so cool to see it, it happen. That's, oh, that's amazing. Cause that really is, you know, you, the passion that you started and then realizing that, you know, organizations need the help because you can't, like there is organic mentorship and there is informal, but really if you want to implement a program, you do need some structure around it. And so I guess what I would ask ne next then is, um, you know, how do you, as an organization that wants to put in a mentor program, um, sometimes they might be small, so they may not need a platform, but for those companies that are large enough, like what would be a starting size that you think it would be really beneficial to have like a platform like Mentor City? Yeah, a lot of um, kind of after we started the public site, very quickly we realized that um, we needed to focus on um, building mentoring programs for organizations that seem to make more sense like business-wise mm -hmm. and that's where our focus has been is um, really helping companies um, establish mentoring programs so back to your question Helen a lot of companies will come to us and they might start with a very small pilot um, just to test the waters for mentoring so whether it's a small company or a large company we see a lot of companies start for with up to like 50 people so it might be like 25 relationships that they're just piloting to see the results of a mentorship program and how that plays out. Um, how What's the engagement like for that program? So that kind of, even if they do that for like a six month relationship with 25 um, matches, um, that's a good way to test uh, mentoring at an organization. Well, that's great. Cause that's where it's sometimes like I still think I know one company I uh, worked with that had about 100 employees. And for every new employee, they had like a mentorship program, not just a buddy, not just an onboarding buddy, but really, that's how they sort of started to connect and formalize a program. And so there was still a lot of manual, right. But I think the beauty of having something where you can still like I've seen that your system evolve as well. Now you have you can do a video chat just like this. There's so many interesting things. Um, and I mean, we're, we'll talk about a lot because, you know, I, I can sort of, uh, I get into this stuff because I'm like so excited about it. But to take a bit of a step back, one of the things I wanted to chat with you about was, and it's nice to know, it's not just for these large, for, you hear about all the Fortune 500s, all these major companies, um, we have Janine's I see had showed up today and she's from CIBC. So there's, there's organizations that can really implement because they have enough people and they're separated remotely. So it's good to connect them through a tool uh, platform. But then this 50 people, like you said, you know, are smaller companies where they can still utilize it. So how would you recommend bringing it to a smaller organization? mentorship itself um 
would you recommend starting with the platform right away or, or do you, or would that only be if there's like really a large number of employees? Yeah, we just launched an architecture company in Chicago. Um, last week it launched a very oh. like, I think they have um, maybe 60 employees, um, maybe nice. a few more, but around that number. And um, um, kind of like you could start um, manually with that number because it might be around 30 matches. You could use an Excel spreadsheet and um, kind of do all the matching manually. Um, and that might work like as a good starting point because at least you're starting to build that mentoring culture, even if you're just matching people and you and you kind of come up with some resources, some guides that support them on what to do during that mentoring relationship. Um, so yeah, so that might work. Like, yeah, but a lot of companies will come to us and say, we want to see more. We want to actually see like the analytics behind the scenes. We want to see our people meeting. How are they rating those meetings? What kind of things are they working towards? What kind of goals are they working towards? What kind of goals are they achieving? So that's when you start to get the real insights. And then you could actually tie the, all those insights back to ROI for the organization. So whether it's a small program, a small um, company or a big company, you can always um, connect things back to um, the business results that you're looking to achieve. Oh, and that's the objectives as well. Yeah, that well, that sounds great because, um, and I think that makes so much sense because otherwise, if you were well, first, it's always recommended to have someone accountable for the program, right? The program manager or someone that can kind of run it and, and, you know, troubleshoot or like match people or, or connect them and the system will help with that. But, you know, I can't imagine having to follow up like, so have you been meeting <laughs> and what are the goals and getting all this paperwork? So I'm definitely a fan of it, right? Um, all the mentees I've worked with in Mentor City, I definitely have, we have put the goals in, we track to it, we track all our hours and meetings. And so it's great to be able to have that reporting. Um, so, you know, you mentioned goal uh, tools, like guides and things like that. So like to take another step back, if I'm a, a HR professional, or even if you don't have one and you or your company, there's talent management or different roles, sometimes it's a business, and you want to put a program in place, you know that all the new recruits um, are asking for mentorship, you know, you hear it, you see all this, all this out there that the newer generations want the um, new to the workforce want mentoring and coaching. And so now you have to kind of put a business case together. So do you have some guidance on that? Like, how would you recommend that someone that that ROI, the return on investment you talked about, how would you put put that together? Like, could you rec make any recommendations for someone that would want to bring in a program? Because, you know, leaders always want to want to know about that the investment and then what's the return and on it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, we have some templates that kind of make that a little easier to like determine, um, asking yourselves questions to um, figure out who the mentoring program's for, what are the business objectives, how are you gonna measure the ROI? And then the whole process around like onboarding, who are you gonna onboard when, um, how's the matching going to happen, kind of thinking, and how long are each of the relationships. So um, kind of putting together a proposal for, um, for senior leadership is a great stepping stone so that you can present your, your vision for the program and how it can roll out. Yeah, I, I love that because that's one of the things I, I think about is, you know, what is the reason? Um, and there's different types of mentorship so there's peer to peer, there's traditional, there could be group mentoring. So really taking that step back and saying, you know, what type of program? Um, is it a traditional one? Or is it something different? Um, and why? Because a lot more peer to peer mentoring. But then having that framework of, you know, how do we want to go about it? And here, you know, having that proposal and helping out. It's definitely it because I think and that's why at the um, some of those statistics help because I, I think originally when I started on this journey and looking at this, 
there was the same studies always being referred to. So it's nice to see some of this newer surveys and studies coming out because it has been, there's a lot more mentoring now. So there's a little bit more data than there would have been even five years ago, I find on, you know, case studies and things like that. So that's, that's always something I think that would be helpful to put in a proposal for leadership to say, hey, by the way, one of our competitors is doing it. So <laughs> maybe we should too, right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't Joanne, even seem like an issue anymore. Like before COVID, there was more like convincing leadership that mentoring is um, how important mentoring is, right? Um, go ahead, mm -hmm. Janine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was. Um, so thank you, Sean. And um, I've had a lot of experience on, on bringing newcomers in, but also implementing a mentorship program within a line of business within the bank. And it, and you're right, there's some intangibles that uh, you are trying to measure. And I think about uh, over COVID, how our juniors, so we hire a lot of analysts and associates coming in, how isolated they feel. And that mentorship program becomes more and more important to connect them to you know, that leadership population because they're no longer having those chats in the elevator or at the water cooler. And so we now have to put more of a structured approach to those, those connects so they can get their face seen. So I can imagine, Sean, that um, the value of mentorship has just gone up and, and just putting some dollars against those intangibles, which is probably reducing their turnover of that first year, um, you know, that type of thing, moving up in their career, that first year onboarding is, is so critical. Um, and so we're trying to do a lot more of that as well. Mm, that's great to hear. Yeah. And the, the other nice thing, like the, the giving back part, which I love that Mentor City has this, the free aspect still. And I know you also support Mentor Canada. Um, I believe their mm -hmm. platform, which if, you know, if you're watching this later, um, or if you were at um, earlier this year in January, I had the executive director on for Mentor Canada. Um, there's so many youth in Canada, like at least 15,000 is what I understood now that are looking for mentorship. So I know this wasn't something we planned for, but I, I, I think that this giving back piece, not only internal mentorship is one thing that I'm like, it's, it's also giving, giving back, giving outside your community. So could organizations provide days for volunteerism or partner with one of these nonprofits or organizations out there, part of their corporate social responsibility, but it's, but through mentorship. So that's one thing I'm going to be, I, I'm really trying to get out there because I think that's a win-win you're doing it inside. And then you're also giving people an ability to, to mentor outside. So are you seeing um, like in the, in the youth space or, or in the nonprofit, Sean, are you seeing a lot of companies, um, not their traditional fundraising, but offering more mentor programs now? Yeah, I see a lot of partnerships with, um, um, like I know in, in Canada, we did the Days of Caring, United Way, um, I know the CIBC and other banks are heavily involved with that, um, where corporations came in. Now they're starting to do it online, like with Mentor City for to support use. And um, so I think that's pretty remarkable um, when corporations are like building these partnerships. Um, I would say over the last couple of years, there's been um, a bunch of um, interesting um, players um, do that. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting. I think Janine at CIBC Triac, right, is the other like not only within your organization, you partner with um, new Canadians as well through. I forget what Triac stands for, but um, Toronto yeah, I can't remember either. Employment Council. Oh, sorry. Right. There you go. Yeah, you go. say that again, mm -hmm. Toronto. Toronto Region Immigrant Employment Council. I should know that. Triac. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, it was um, a little bit. <laughs> oh, you were too. Yeah. yeah, it's a great experience because they they actually do uh, a couple of things for the mentors and the mentees. They they really give you structured on the boundaries of that conversation. So, Helen, when you think about how do you start something up, it's really important to educate the mentors on what their role and accountability is because they're not their role isn't to help 
get them to new jobs. It's it's to guide, open their open their network, introduce them to people. And sometimes they forget that and they think they need to go above and beyond where really the role of the mentee is, is also to do work. And I really appreciated understanding those boundaries on how I need to show up, what's what I need to do and what the mentee needed to do so that it was a win-win. So we both knew what success looked like and we had a very nice time bound in order to do it. So great tools, great structure, uh, great support with them. And I think to this day, I follow at least three of them in their, in their careers oh, no um, now that they're That's in awesome. Canada. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. LinkedIn is yeah. pretty powerful. So. Well, and just that's, that's the beauty of, of the giving and the mentoring. I just, and so, I mean, I get a goosebumps. This is a um, great, a great topic, but I think, and I think what's really interesting, I mean, co coaching has kind of been starting to confuse a little bit um, because with mentoring, like you, you mentioned a few things that would, were themes that came out of the people that I interviewed, which is really so guidance for the mentor mentee, which I know that, uh, Sean, I understand you provide some of those guides as part of your onboarding a new client with the system, because it's not enough to just, hey, let's match people. We have the system. There's these tools, but how do you use them? And then what guidance? Because I've had lots of stories where people say, you know, someone said, hey, um, I'd love you to be my mentor. And the mentor is like, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but only a little. Um, but really, because there's these programs and not everybody knows about them or, you know, or a mentee too. what's my responsibility? Like, a lot of times people say you've got to lead it like you, you have to also do that inward thinking about well, what is it your what are your goals for this finite time? So Janine, you mentioned the time bound, which is really important mm -hmm. too. Yes. Um, and then having those goals help. And I think, so Sean, maybe you can touch on, are you seeing, cause you're, you've grown a lot mentor city and you're seeing more clients and more, are, are clients starting a lot more to, to link it to the, to the development as well. So another way to not just courses, but another way to enhance development skills in, in an organization. Yeah, definitely. Like we've always seen like in um, companies like connected to performance review processes and kind of setting standards um, of building a culture by um, checking in during the performance review process and even um, connecting their leadership development or performance review processes right into a platform like Mentor City um, that reiterates um, the messaging. So um, and that also helps us with the matching, um, the algorithms behind the scenes. So we're Kind of taking into account where people want to develop and what they're strong in to recommend good mentors um, and mentees mm -hmm. so that that's very helpful for for like platforms like us for sure yeah and i think i think that's again starting when you take a step back and just say okay well what is what is it we want to accomplish as an organization you know what are the outcomes we want to see and then you know i can see like where where sometimes in the you know, past days where, um, you know, there wasn't the commitment, um, there was too many, not enough mentors. So it's really, there's all of those other challenges. And that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, like, from your experience or working with a lot of companies that have them, what would you say are some of the challenges with putting in a program? And then how to maybe, you know, what are some ways to kind of um address them yeah yeah i think it's it's interesting like i just was thinking about something else as well like because of covid what how mentor city has really evolved is it's become like a, a more of a social platform where people are jumping in and out of water cooler conversations throughout the entire platform so whether it's networking or mentoring it all happens there because people want to feel more connected um, to the, the association or community that they belong to. Um, so I think that helps to overcome some of the issues because you're creating a community. A actually, everything that you do like on a platform is like creating a community. Whether you have an event orientation session, you could build um, discussions that help leading up to that event, people getting to know each other, start formulating questions, 
then it gives them a space to talk about what they learned after the event. So it creates like um, on like it's no longer just a one hour webinar. It's a uh, it's a whole community that you're building from an event. So I think that's what we've seen from COVID is people want that more um, kind of connection um, to um, to their organization. So we've built a lot of cool things like that 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 bring that all together. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, the chats and the because that's I mean that's where historically when you think about it several years ago, um, and I'm sure there's been an evolution in the technology, but um, it would be the matching and then the party, you know, the participants would have to go, they'd set up their meetings outside of it, they'd still track and everything, but there's so much more capability now within it. Like, as I was mentioning, I can now do a video with my mentee. And so it kind of another topic we were going to talk about was virtual mentoring. And I feel like if anything, like because everybody was online, well, a lot of people were online and trying to get the connection, we saw a lot more um, mentoring being developed. Um, do you feel like there's any um, differences between like a virtual mentoring relationship versus an in-person? Not really. <laughs> but I, I'm like one of those people that I used to like, I would meet with my mentee like or my mentor like once in person and then everything else would be phone calls or pretty much phone calls back then and now life is all uh, video but I feel like yeah. it's just um saves a lot of time energy oh. just um be able to have these kinds of um calls and chats it's, yeah I mean it, I love I think that you still want to have build the connection somehow first um mm -hmm. But this is the next best thing versus a phone call or I, I find phone calls like now that I don't do them as much, it's like you can't tell the cues of when to speak. So you're like, do I talk now? Or <laughs> it's so bizarre. Mm -hmm. I still like it for a break once in a while. Right. But um, but yeah, um, virtual mentoring, I think a lot of that again, it's like this could be some of the silver lining that came out of um, the pandemic in that this. Um, the need for the, because mentoring really is about that connection, right? And relationship building. And so to have a, a mechanism to do it and for an organization to actually understand the value. And I'm like that now we don't, you don't have to sell it as much, right? Because that was always the challenge with, you know, HR talent programs, right? It's like, oh, why don't they get this? Like, it's so no brainer, but <laughs> like, they don't get it. They need a, like a huge long business case or something. Um, so do you think it's going to continue to grow mentorship programs and or like, do you think more and more organizations are going to start needing to implement them? Yeah, yeah I think we're, we're scratching the surface. Because um, when we started um, looking at stats, um, with COVID, um, everything increased. So if you even think of like simple things like people opening up emails, if we were getting like, if we sent out 5,000 emails in a day, we had 7,000 emails opened. It doesn't mean that the emails were from the same day, but they were being opened like another day. So we saw like that kind of engagement um, increase. Um, mm. And even the video calls, people are, um, more on Mentor City, um, so longer times like on the platform. So we saw like overall engagement everywhere on the platform. Yeah, so. I like the I like the ease of it all being in there, you know. And when mm -hmm. and when you have the, and I'll we'll get to you in a sec, Janine. But when you have the mechanism to set the meetings up within the platform to actually do the video and it'll all track it for you. I mean, you can also implement extra hours manually if you had a side meeting, coffee or something, but, um, and just be able to track the goals there. And, and I get notifications as a reminder for my meeting, which is often very important in my email because <laughs> I will forget. Um, so Janine, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, just a, a comment and a question for Sean. I'm thinking about the, your growth strategy and uh, the pandemic has really, broken down the geographical barriers. So right now we're allowed and we are hiring 
from all over the world. It doesn't really matter where you're sitting. You can join a team in Toronto and be sitting in, in the UK. And I'm wondering if that is opening up the opportunity for more people wanting to connect. So to understand what's, what's, uh, what's available as far as job opportunities from the different parts of the world. And then the other comment is, um, you know, CIBC is probably not alone, but we're looking for to broaden and be more inclusive on who we hire, right? So we wanna make sure that we broaden um, hiring people from different parts of the world so that we have a more inclusive approach to our team management. And we've got, you know, for example, in, in case of HR, I know that we need to look at hiring more men in HR because we're predominantly female. And so we need to broaden our talent um, scouting, I guess. And I don't know if that all that plays into some of the work that you're doing. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Like, I think for sure, um, because companies are more global now, um, that mentorship's playing a more global role, um, helping people feel like they're more part of the company, no matter where the head office is. Um, we're yeah. seeing lots and lots of global initiatives. And then I was just thinking about what you're saying about recruitment. Um, what I like about mentoring and recruitment is that it's a safe way to, um, with no expectations, where you're actually meeting people that could be your top talent in a very like mentoring um, style, but it's a great way to see if they would be a good fit for the organization as well. That's what happened with um, when I worked in the not-for-profit with newcomers to Canada. The um, All the people that came into that organization were so um, amazed by the talent of newcomers to Canada that they started, per, um, there's this one person in um, compliance um, within the bank and he met with executives from one of the banks. And um, after the session, he came up to me and he said, I did it, yes, I did it. And within a week, he had a job offer within compliance at the uh, bank. I was like, so that's like the power of this kind of mentoring. It's, yeah. It does open doors and in a safe way to do it. Oh, I, I love that. Thanks for bringing that up, both of you. And, and just that, you know, when you think about it, um, and Joanne has a question after, but, um, you know, this whole linkage to sponsorship as well, right? So the coaching mentorship sponsorship, and I talk about like, what are the differences, but, you know, from a, from an equity, diversity, inclusion perspective, like, you know, you do want to ensure that there's comfort in those relationships too. But opportunity, I think this is great because I one of my pet peeves, a little rant I have sometimes is about how in a lot of programs historically, it was like for the high performers only or mm -hmm. the chosen few. And I'm like, well, they have they have great skills, right? They yeah. let's get everybody else some more skills, like mentorship for all, right? For everyone and lift everybody up. So that's my soapbox for the day. But that's why we're here talking about it. And uh, I know, I know Sean shares that about the value of that. And that's why, you know, this providing it free for anyone, like you can create, you can find that person that is going to lift you up and lift each other up. So it's beautiful. So thank you for that. Those are great. And Joanne, you have a comment or question you want to share? Yeah, I had a question actually. Hello, everyone. Um, for Sean, uh, regarding reverse mentoring, I haven't participated in Mentor City, but I have heard, you know, rumblings of um, reverse mentoring. And are more organizations sort of use a lot utilizing that as, um, you know, people are exiting the organization and new people are coming in? Is that starting to become a thing, or what's happening with that? Yeah, yeah, reverse mentoring is really interesting. Um, I know Helen and I were talking about GE before, and I think that's where it all came from. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a, a telecom um, that's doing a little bit of all the best practices um, in mm -hmm. mentoring. So they're doing reverse mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring, group mentoring, and they've really used the platform, really cool way to build in reverse mentoring as well. Mm -hmm. But it's basically when a, a senior executive wants to or someone that senior wants to learn from someone that may be younger in a topic that they're interested in, like social media or something yeah. like that. 
So there's lots and lots of benefits to reverse mentoring or any mentoring, because I, I also read something today where it's, well, we've, Helen and I have been talking about this forever, but just like how it is a um, give and take relationship and that you're learning from each other no matter what um, you're, you're focused on in a mentoring relationship as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So Jack Welch, 1999, I know that one, right? Because he coined the term. And that's where this was pre-tech boom, right? So the tech boom. And so, I mean, you know, they wouldn't have known how to deal with Zoom back then. Right? We still don't know. But the, so those skills that were needed, I love that concept. And, and so the extension like peer-to-peer -peer or reciprocal mentoring, it, which is kind of my favorite, right? Which is really, no matter what, what you have to offer, there's always something you can, you can learn from each other. And so, cause a lot of, it's interesting cause I've had one, one woman I interviewed for the book and she, she and I were, we met at ADP Canada and we were mentoring each other and it always bothered her the, the whole traditional mentorship, because she's like, it's not just some, you know, someone that's going to, you know, show me the ropes, like I have a lot to show you too. So, um, you know, everybody has their own opinions about it. I like the idea of having a number of different types of mentor programs, because I think in some cases, you could have it like curricula based where the group mentoring where, you know, everybody needs the same skill set development. Um, and then maybe you have different mentors coming in to do different topics. Like people might think it's teaching, but it's not always, right? So, um, but peer to peer, I mean, there's so many different ways. Um, Joanne, I was curious when you asked about that because I was thinking back about the whole, you know, this discussion around losing the baby boomers, which we're, we're all sticking around. So <laughs> I pretend I'm not in that category. I pretend I'm a Gen X still, but that's okay. I'm right on the cusp. But this whole thing that there was going to be this mass, like everybody was going to be leaving and they're not. So I feel like mentoring would be a great way of that succession. And so that so that you don't the knowledge loss you know how like you want to retain the knowledge often someone leaves and then all of a sudden it's like wait where is everything they have all this in their mind nothing's documented and so a way to really like when someone is ready to leave an organization um, a great way to maybe go to part-time and then start you know mm -hmm. mentoring others and passing on the knowledge I don't know what do you think about that Anybody can answer that too, Sean, you can start. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I think it's like one of the um, best ways of succession planning is passing on that knowledge to the next generation, kind of figuring out who, who, who you could teach um, and kind of is building a legacy too, which I think mentoring is a, is a very special for because um, you're passing on your knowledge to the next generation so it doesn't end it never mm -hmm. ends yeah it never ends it goes on and on and on and that ripple eventually everybody's going to mentor and be mentored and give back to others um so i was just going to share my screen again for a few minutes just to see if i had um i will go through this um Oh, I will share out this presentation and I also on lifeworkswell.ca, all the mentor circles are up there and um, they'll be on YouTube as well. So you can come back and watch it. Um, and then this resource will be up there too. And really it's just kind of touching on some of the things we talked about as far as sort of a structure on, you know, challenges. Um, I like to hear that there's probably less challenges in convincing people that, you know, mentorship is, is such an amazing thing. So um, I'm, I'm very excited about the future. Um, I did kind of put a little bit of a blurb on some of the types of mentoring and just little definitions people can look at later if they're curious. I, I would assume it's part of the program management that, you know, once they decide what kind they can, you know, do an explanation or a guide on on what's happening in the organization. So there's a little bit more people can look at this. Um, I created some icebreakers too. just again, 
the first part is that it's almost like interviewing before you commit to a mentor relationship. And then there's mentor city courses and a few other, a few other resources there. Um, and then I'm going to keep finding more mentorship quotes. So if each of you want to give me one personally um, and share more of your story, um, we'll, we'll spend a few more minutes because we probably have a few more questions. But I just want to say thanks again. And then you can click on these links to find Sean. So when you get the presentation, but um, just check out Mentor City, connect with him on LinkedIn, follow all the amazing work. And I can't wait to see what's gonna happen. And then you know me, everybody knows me that's here. Um, but I just, um, I'm so excited because one of the things when I was doing my research, I started back in, I left ADP Canada in July, 2017. And I said out loud, and I don't know why, I said I was gonna write a book about mentorship because I was frustrated about why is not, why is, you know, why is mentorship not available for everybody? And I just started to get on this like road of researching and talking to people and, and was very passionate about it. And then I put it on hold. But when I started, there was about 12 mentor platforms that I was aware of. Now I think there's over 40. Um, sure. So I guess that's <laughs> tough for you. Um, you were one of the first. I mean, that's what I mean. That's what's so amazing um, all over the globe. But I love that Canadian, um, you're Canadian owned and started. And, you know, that there's still room to me. I mean, there's so much. So I'm, I'm very hopeful to see that things are growing. And every day I'm, I don't know, maybe it's just coming to me because I'm, I'm immersed in it, but I see something on mentorship. I see a new blog. I see another organization or um, in the entrepreneur space. Um, so I think it's, it's here to stay. So do you have any um, like predictions on what's going to happen in the world of mentoring going forward? Um, any thoughts on that, Sean? Yeah, I think like what I what I'm excited about is like connecting mentoring more to courses or curriculum. So adding more structure to mentoring, um, kind of bringing those relationships to the next level where um, they're more impactful, they're more um, focused. Um, that's what I love about goals. Um, what we've done with goals is more of a collaborative approach now. So the mentee and mentor are working together. So I see a lot more collaboration, a lot more flexibility in mentoring. Um, and ways to like um, give people ideas of what to do um, during those mentoring conversations so that they're like more resources like your book, Helen, um, to ensure that people <laughs> have um, the right tools in their toolkit when they're having these conversations. But I think like a lot of um, um, more meaningful connections could happen. and in a variety of ways. So oh, yeah, I think it's I an exciting time. I think we're just scratching the surface. I think the last two years have, has given us like the ability to really like um, mm -hmm. um, evolve, evolve mentoring. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, that's the beauty is that I think, I think that everybody thinks there's this huge cost associated with it. Um, and so that whole return on investment, but um you know, I, I kind of think if you start with the focus on these connections and development in this way and provide this, because I know all the universities, like they're having, my daughter was running a mentor program, like more and more, this is going to be an expectation as far as wait, like in an interview, like, do you have mentoring programs? What do you, and so the curricula based one, I think that I love that too, because to me, that's a great way of for group mentoring. Because often, you know, a lot of times people, there's this one, one individual that is an amazing leader or mentor and everybody, but they, they just don't have the capacity to do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, otherwise, they'd be a full-time mentor. That'd be their job. That would be, I'd sign up for that one. <laughs> is there a job description that, for that? But so to have those um, people be able to say here, I'm, the same themes are coming up all the time. Let's work on communication skills. And so it's a different way of the development. It's still mentoring though. It's not like it's a professor academia type thing, right? So it's really 
and you can still get you know nuanced um, advice for people and depending on your expertise right that's why i love that so i'll be looking forward to seeing that and how you can use the system to kind of do that i guess you would do the video so we'll chat a little bit more about that now what about advice for someone who they don't have a mentor program in their organization and they want to kind of have someone and they don't you know again coaching because a lot of times you pay for coaching so you know, not everybody can afford that. So what's your advice on how people can go out and find a mentor? We're going to wrap up soon, but that would be a, a good question. Maybe I'll ask everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Joanne, what about you? Do you, um, are you interested in either being a mentor or looking for one? Well, now that I've spent all this time listening to all these amazing things, yeah, I think that's something I, I would like to check out. Absolutely. Um, so a little bit about me. I have been away from the workforce because I was caregiving for about six years, and now I want to kind of get back into it. And being away from everything, because caregiving is is very, you know, you're just in another world. Um, I have absolutely no idea how to reconnect. And I think that something like a mentor program might be something even for me, you know, wow, hey, I could see what people are doing these days. And, and HRPA, uh, I just put a plug yeah. in for there. <laughs> and happy to be in different roles, like be a mentor or a mentee. I, I think in, in any way to connect, I think it sounds really like, um, I don't know, a different approach, probably better than coaching, I think. Anyway, that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, coaching, I mean, there's a difference, right? As far as, yeah. because a lot of times is a coach is just asking, like they're really asking the question so you can find it within yourself versus the tra traditional advice giving, right? Which is what you need sometimes, right? You just want, hey, you've been, you. I see your career, your trajectory, I've, or I've just, admire the person you are and how you show up and I just would love to learn from you and that's that's sort of the advice right is like kind of you have to sort of build a relationship with people first though right so I will get you hooked up with the next round of HRPA uh, we have lots of people in Toronto West that are looking for um, and you're still a member of HRPA. So yeah. It, yeah. again, that's a great that'll be actually a great way to you kind of to re engage with yeah. people. You know. Mm -hmm. um, also talking to someone that's also like supported um, someone and they kind of jump back into the workforce, like more of that personal mentor, I think would be interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Kind of see how the kind of the challenges that they faced um, when they were looking after someone for long term and um, how they overcame those. And, and I think that's kind yeah. of cool. That's another mentoring, the personal mentor. Oh, cool. okay. <laughs> sure. Well. Like, and to relate to that off ramp, right? Like, yeah. of, and, and you know, what's fascinating. I mean, we could keep going and I'll let Janine give her advice in a second, but what's fascinating is that like, cause you know, I've been around for a while. So some things do come up again, but the supports now for people, for example, after a childcare leave or an mm. elder care leave, I just posted on LinkedIn about this because there's now organizations and communities that if the organization's not providing support now, they're bringing women together. How do you get navigate return to work? Same thing with you. Like it's elder care versus child care, but it's a, it's a long break yeah. to let, deal with this. And if a company's not providing supports for re-entry, I mean, you're, it's different if you're gone for like a year or, in, sure. you know, your leave, but um, I have a friend who actually stayed home for about six years too, right after childcare. So, mm. you know, who knows if there's stigma, like there's a lot. So it's finding maybe a little networking group too, that you mm -hmm. know, people that have been through that and how are they re-entering mentorship is wonderful. Finding that person with the lived experience that they can share is like, that's, that's one of the things. So it's where to find them too. Right. Hang yeah. out on LinkedIn a little bit more. <laughs> Janine said that LinkedIn is awesome. Janine, what about your, you're still mentoring. Um, you, you have been a mentor through the CIBC, but do you have advice on people like, um, you know, or even for yourself, like how would you go about looking for someone, your next mentor or mentee? Mm -hmm. Oh, are you on, on mute? mute? Can't hear you. 
Mm -hmm. oh. oh, yeah, there we go. Um, first of all, I would say it how important it is. And I think it's important for so many reasons and and to really nurture that network um, all the time. And I, I know we all get busy and we get busy with our families and, and caught up in things, but staying connected to those uh, thought leaders and like minds, even virtually is really important. But when you find those people, um, and Helen, you're that person for me, there, that informal mentoring, where there's just those people you know you can reach out to that are thought leaders in their space and you've got this relationship. I think that informal mentorship is really important. And I have probably a little collective group that I can jump to for different things um, anytime. And I try and keep that informal mentoring going because uh, mentoring is, is a big commitment and you, you can't take it on lightly. You have to actually structure it into your world. So I try and do it sporadically throughout the year, but in between all that, I do keep up with my informal mentoring, whether it's me mentoring folks, uh, and that could be just uh, my team, um, or reaching out to those that I really ins are inspired by, for sure. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that's, that's fantastic. And that's where, when it becomes more of a formal structured program, having those guidelines and you know, um, resources available through like a company like Mentor City, that they provide the guidance and having a plan of communication to make it successful, right? Because really that commitment of time and the connection and having the goals, all of that, the things we talked about today. So I'm going to give Sean, first I'm going to say thanks again, Sean. Um, it's always a pleasure when I get to speak with you. And I hope that those watching later got a few tidbits and You'll hear more from us probably going forward because I am going to just be continue to champion for mentorship in organizations. Um, any final parting wisdom for us, Sean, as we wrap up today? Thank you, Helen, for inviting me. It's been a great conversation. I've learned a lot, just like a mentoring relationship. I always leave these conversations with new insights, so I really appreciate being here with everyone. So. Um, yeah well good luck so with much. everything can't <laughs> wait to see what's next and um keep in touch and everybody else have a wonderful day thanks for coming today i appreciate it.